we should really take into account how there's a huge difference, an abyss, I would say, between females and males in terms of physical and psychological cues that make them be aroused physically and psychologically. Yeah, exactly. I mean, thank you for bringing up this point. Look, when I talk to guys and I help them with dating or relationships, like the, what's the first excuse that I hear as a coach? I don't have the looks. And I say, okay, like who, who cares about your looks? Are you trying to attract another guy? I say, no. And I tell them, if you are attracting a girl, yeah, looks are good. Yeah, make sure that you maximize your looks. But they are not at all important. And again, this is the same reason we guys get addicted to porn. It's all about the visual component for us with girls. And that's why we emphasize this visual component in porn. Roman Mironov. Am I pronouncing your surname correctly? Mironov? Ah, uh, you're 70% there. <laughs> okay. And as most of my listeners already know, I'm really into the distinction between what is good and what feels good. And this is certainly one of the cases. Roman is really into coaching and showing people how porn is actually not worth it in the long term, even if in the short term it might feel good. And this is one more example of the same feature that transcends all reality, which is that there's a lot of things which feel good in the short term, even if they are not good. And then there's other things which feel bad in the moment, even if they are good in the long term. Hello, Roman. How are you? Hi, Alex. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm super excited to be here with you, especially because I, we already talked and I realized that you are a very, very intelligent person and... Yeah, that was, I enjoyed our conversation. So looking forward to this one. Thank you very much. Okay, so what are the main drawbacks of consuming porn online? And why, why is it that you are against it? Uh, I think the main drawback is that you, you, you have a stronger erection. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> of course, the main drawback is that watching Pixel Girls teaches your brain that this is real sex, well, while it's not. So then you literally rewire your synaptic pathways in your brain to get aroused by these online images, these pixel girls, instead of the real thing. So when it comes down to real sex, you either don't want it or you sort of want it, but then you have performance anxiety. And finally... Sometimes what happens, well, not sometimes, actually quite often, is that a real girl, if you're a guy, she doesn't excite you. You don't get aroused because she is way, way less beautiful than a porn actress. Because a porn actress is designed to be beautiful. It's, it's not the real thing. So you basically give this fake candy to your brain. And then you tell your brain that this feels good. And you should like it instead of the real thing. Because let's face it, the real thing is also hard in so many ways. I mean, to get it. You do enjoy it, but you need to work to get sex. Yeah, I, I think that that's one example of a super stimuli. There's an extremely hilarious example that I read about. Joel Beetle from Australia, from Western Australia, in which people used to throw bottles of beer to the, to the street and then in the middle of a pathway, there's people crossing and then they see that there's a bottle in which there's the male of this beetle trying to have sex with the bottle because the bottle is actually bigger, more bright and has all the characteristics, all the features that he's been evolved to be hijacked by the female characteristics. That bottle has it in a bigger proportion. So they not, not only are attracted to the bottle, but they prefer the bottle to the actual female. <laughs> which is absurd in natural selection terms because it, it destroys their capacity to reproduce. Exactly. As they say, no vagina is better than a man's hand. Because, look, when you're pleasing yourself, you know exactly what you want to do, how you want to please yourself, and you, you know the exact sequence. And when it comes to having real sex, it's not like that. It's different and it's better in many ways. But in terms of just this stimulation, physical stimulation, you're right. 
You're so right. Because the porn industry, it hijacks this mechanism that we guys have built into our brain. Our goal is to find the cutest, which equals the, the healthiest girl out there and to mate her. And the porn, oh, yeah, we can abuse that actually. Let's make, let's make, present a perfect scene. A girl that has beautiful body, which is probably 60% artificial at this point. She has all the stuff like jewelry, lingerie, stockings, high heels. And I don't want even to go further into this because then it turns into fetishes and all, all, <laughs> all that kind of weird stuff, cre creepy stuff. And then it presents this beautiful picture to you as a guy and you go, oh, that's what I want. And I've been there. I don't want to diminish you in any way. I've been there. I know it's difficult, and I don't mean you, Alex, but I, I mean our listeners. Yeah. But the, the point is that if you taught your brain to be addicted to pornography, that's the main reason, the beautiful picture, or one of the main reasons. Yeah. There's a huge difference in the sexual software between males and females, and not in acknowledging this is where most of the problems in our current society comes from. I think males tend to perceive that females are as excited about physical features as males are, and that's entirely not the case. Females are much more into narratives, love, and uh, stories about achieving love and more of a long-term commitment due to evolutionary reasons, I would say. And the reason why porn hijacks so much males, I would say, is the evolutionary heritage that we have evolved, the tools that we have been given by evolution, which are the constant seeking of insemination of the most, the, the most females as possible. That cannot be the case with females. Females can only reproduce at most once a year. But males, the minimum investment they have to do in order to procreate is some three minutes of tiring cardio. So we should really take into account how there's a huge difference, an abyss, I would say, between females and males in terms of physical and psychological cues that make them be aroused physically and psychologically. Yeah, exactly. I mean, thank you for bringing up this point. Look, when I talk to guys and I help them with dating or relationships, like the, what's the first excuse that I hear as a coach? I don't have the looks. And... I say, okay, like, who, who cares about your looks? Are you trying to attract another guy? I say, no. And I tell them, if you are attracting a girl, yeah, looks are good. Yeah, make sure that you maximize your looks. But they are not at all important. And again, this is the same reason we guys get addicted to porn. It's all about the visual component for us with girls. And that's why we emphasize this visual component in porn. There you go. And... By the way, what you said is just beautiful. You said t t three minutes of tiring cardio. Yeah. I love that. I love that. That's that's not the... I mean, as a joke, is great, but it's definitely not the perspective that we want to, to teach our listeners. Because I would say that, yeah, on the lowest level, it's three minutes of tiring cardio. Even one. On the de <laughs> How do you know that I, I'm so bad at sex? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But... There is a deeper level to sex, really deeper level. And at that level, it's, it's like an eternity of intimate pleasure and deep connection with your girl. So that's what you want to aim at, not the fake reality of porn that the porn industry shows you and tricks you into thinking that this is the real deal. No, it's not. Exactly. And... Just from your comment about how fake it is, I, I'm thinking about how the biological cues that we are evolved to perceive as being signals of success in evolutionary terms, like being aroused sexually and having a lot of ejaculations, or being per perceiving a lot of different female, uh, naked female bodies, that's signaling our amygdala or our more instinctive parts of the, our brains, that we are actually achieving a lot of evolutionary success when it's actually not the case. 
I've been reading a book called The Case Against the Sexual Revolution by Louis Perry, and I would like to share with you a quote I've highlighted about from this book, which is, this is an extract from the book. Porn is to sex as McDonald's is to food. These two capitalist enterprises take our natural appetites, pluck out the most compulsive and addictive elements, strip away anything truly nutritious, and then encourage us to consume more and more. Both products are examples of super stimuli, exaggerated versions of naturally occurring stimuli that tap into our evolved longing for nourishment, excitement, and pleasure, but do so in a maladaptive way, fooling the consumer into gorging on a product that, that initially feels good, but in the long term does harm. This is precisely what I was referring to. Louis Perry has been capable to perfectly resemble the topic in hand here in that our evolutionary drives, what make us want to do things, one of the main things that makes us want to achieve things as males is the seeking for reproduction. And once you take that out of the equation because your brain is already receiving the signal of, of being satisfactory at that, your motivations will be much lower. I think that's one of the key points here, isn't it? Wait, did you just say that McDonald's is bad? Yeah, in, in terms of food. <laughs> yeah, I'm kidding. Sorry, sorry, I'm teasing you. I, I guess I have to cancel my McDonald's appointment for tonight <laughs> for celebrating the new year. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I love McDonald's, but I prefer to love it on, at a distance. Just... <laughs> Enjoy the smells, you know, or seeing the the smiles on the happy faces of people coming out of there and thinking, nah, I don't want that kind of happiness. That's that's artificial happiness. That that's like the, the, they are buying a little bit of short term pleasure and pain with their health, pain with their energy in the long term. Nah, same thing with porn. Exactly. What um. Uh, I look at porn in through this lens of three types of pleasure. So they are selfish pleasure, sustainable pleasure, and stoic pleasure. I guess you like that. <laughs> yeah, I do. All right. So porn, to explain it, porn is completely selfish pleasure. It's just about you. It's about feeling the pleasure right now instant gratification and exchanging it for pain later and it also kills your motivation now the second type is sustainable pleasure which is much better because you still trade you still trade some you, you get some pleasure in the moment but basically you don't have pain after it you don't and it also gives you it's a little bit of motivation, not that much. And an example would be, let's say you relax at the end of the day and you talk to a friend or you watch some Netflix or you practice the guitar, like whichever your hobby is. Now, the final thing is the real thing. It's the stoic pleasure. That's when you feel pain now. Sounds crazy, but bear with me. And you trade it for pleasure later. What is pain? Pain is something that you feel when you push yourself, when you challenge yourself. Let's say you are at the gym and the pain for you right now is pushing the weight. Let's say you're doing squats. I don't think you like it. Um, I've seen just one person who likes squats and he lives under the bridge. He's kind of crazy. <laughs> no, I'm <laughs> kidding. I'm kidding. Now, when you do that stoic pleasure, you feel pain in the moment, but then you feel pleasure for a long time. You feel proud. You feel great. Let's say with, with the squatting example, when I push myself in squats, next day, my legs are sore. And when I get up and I walk around, I feel great because I feel pain. My legs are sore. And I realize that I push myself hard. And this gives me a reminder that I've done the right thing. And this also gives me motivation. So. The idea is to move from selfish pleasure, just remove it 100%, then have like 10% of sustainable pleasure in your life, that one hour of watching Netflix, the proverbial Netflix. <laughs> and then you need to have like 80 to 90% of stoic, stoic pleasure, which like number one, number one for me would be 
working hard or studying hard, whatever you're doing. But if you're studying hard, you still need to work hard. That's that's my belief. And the second thing would be creating a romantic relationship in your life. That's also hard work, but the but the dividend is outstanding. That's the pleasure that I'm talking about. What are you referring to? Studying being hard, still requiring to work hard in terms of people who study should also have a job? Or were you saying that studying is inherently hard? Yes, I, I'm, I'm having a sidekick job. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, it is controversial, but I would say when you're 12, you should be starting making money because you're big enough not to ask your parents for money. And that's fine. And um, yeah, it's okay. I guess it's okay to be, let's say, 18 years old and still live with your parents and like have them pay for everything. But I would rather, let's say I have a 13-year-old son and I beat him to death with this. <laughs> He's prob he probably hates me. Hi, Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> I tell him, dude, don't ask me for money. Don't go to your mom for money. Develop a practical skill right now that people will pay you for to make sure that you, do, when you're 18 and you need money, you don't go to get a job at McDonald's. Somehow we're getting back to it all the time. I guess. Yeah. I guess we're we're both hungry. <laughs> anyway, yeah, not the right. McDonald's. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of benefit to being independent and being capable of producing your own money, and I've been definitely. I would say I've been I've committed the error of not starting to work earlier in my life. I should have. And that's definitely a point which I would have enjoyed more in the beginning, being part of the productive part of life, I would say. But I will say this. Look, looking into you, talking to you and getting to know you a little bit, I think you're doing amazing. First of all, well, the fact that you read so much, you're so intelligent, then you're 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 stoic. I mean, this is impressive at 21. I, I started to think about stoicism around like age of 37. And finally, finally, I, I, I really have to compliment you on, on your English. It's, uh, it's very, very well built, very well structured, great choice of words. So with that said, I meant, yeah, you did not maybe start early with uh, your work, but you did a good job developing other skills. So high five there. And you are, in this sense, a good example of spending the time doing the right thing, developing yourself, even though it's, it wasn't developing yourself in the work direction, but you still developed yourself instead of wasting time on mindless activities like watching porn. So that's what we want our listeners to do. Th thank you for the compliments. But in relation to the English one, I guess that if you are complimenting my English skills, that's because you've noticed that I'm not native. And that's part of a non-compliment, I would say. What do you think? <laughs> uh, yeah, you got me there. You got me there. I mean, look, you still have accent. Yeah. And this, this is the only thing that, I guess, for me, says that you're non-native. Otherwise, you're talking like a highly educated native speaker of English. And by the way, the accent, for me... And also for many other people, it makes you even more outstanding because it is a reminder that you learned the English language and you did a very good job at it. I mean, we, because of your accent, we appreciate your English even more. Thank you. You made a distinction previously about between the second and the third kind of uh, pleasure. The second one was the sustainable and the third one was the stoic one. I don't think there's a black or white distinction there. When I'm reading a book, I'm simultaneously enjoying the activity and knowing that I'm investing into my future by putting a lot of knowledge and wisdom into my future self. So I, I don't think you can do a, a strict distinction there. I, I agree with you in that a lot of occasions require you to do a sacrifice in the short term, like it would be to transition from an habit of consuming porn to not doing so and uh, approaching uh, people you feel attracted to in the street, that that would be uh, positive in, in my, my opinion. But it's also true that you can enjoy the moment if you are sufficiently adapted to that activity, like it is my case in, in the case of going to the gym or listening to podcasts or reading a book. Of course, you're right. There is there is no point in arguing about this, even though we could argue about details. But the whole thing about black and white thinking, 
no, no, it's wrong. It's life is yeah, life is mostly about the gray scale between the black and white. So yeah, and th there is uh, when I talk about the scale of three pleasures, the idea is just just to remind you that like like to give you this lens to look at these things. Yeah, but, but yeah, yeah. Of course you're right. And and look, if you can turn a stoic pleasure into a sustainable pleasure, you are my hero. Because yeah, that's reading a difficult book like I don't know, some kind of philosophy like Hegel and deriving pleasure from it, that's for me that's stoic pleasure. And if you can label it for yourself as sustainable pleasure, Wow. Kudos. <laughs> yeah. And there, there's a transition there. The brain has a huge plasticity that allows you to enjoy the, the things that you have been exposed to in the past. There was like a, a few, uh, I've read recently in a, in a book, I don't remember which one, there's like your acts create habits, your habits create uh, routines and your routines create uh, a lifestyle. And then the lifestyle creates your outcomes. And that is signals to me that hey every single action i'm taking is a vote for my future self so let's rather do the correct thing now so that i can progressively get towards the better version of myself and i've experienced this in a super curious example that i, I tend to take care of my habits and do the thing that i know rationally to be correct and then when i'm exposed to something which is not correct but feels good in the moment like a donut i maybe taste it but I'm not attracted to it in the same way that I used to a few years ago. There's a repulsion from my inside that is generated due to the exposure to good habits and a good diet, which was not there before I was so mindful about my habits. And I think the same thing can happen with porn. Porn is not as attractive to me as it could have been seven years ago due to the exposure to actual females and the the reality of what how a healthy sexual relationship can be so yeah i think that there, that plasticity should be used in the most uh, adequate way possible yeah 100 percent um can you give me a sec i need to go grab my donut i'll be right back <laughs> <laughs> anyway anyway the plasticity is huge this is one of the main questions that guys have when they feel that they are addicted to porn how long will it take my brain to heal from pornography? And the first answer is, yes, you can actually heal your brain. Yes, it takes time because it's, yeah, it's plasticity. It doesn't mean that it happens overnight, even though a lot of people want to, happen it, to have it happen overnight. No, the truth is you'll have to work. And on general, on average, I realize that it happens it takes about 30 to 90 days. And with my journey, it was like this. So around 30 days, I felt very excited about quitting porn. I mean, 30 days of no porn, not watching it at all. I felt excited. I felt motivated to keep going. But I still felt that there was this urge in me to watch it sometimes. When I went to 60 days, I, I've, I felt porn free. Yes, I had urges, but they were... They were not significant. And at 90 days, I think my full transformation happened. I started to hate porn because I finally opened my eyes to what it is. And one thing that people prefer to ignore when they watch porn is how exactly that porn has been created. So for one, the porn industry is abusing a lot of people people who are not well-educated, who are young, and it takes advantage of them. And then it also takes advantage of kids. Let's say who are 10, 11, 12 years old, the porn industry shows their porn to them. They don't know the difference between the real sex and this fake sex, and they feel that this fake sex is actually the real thing. They get, they get excited, they get addicted. Or maybe they not get addicted, but the, those golden years that we're talking about, when you're supposed to develop yourself, they waste a lot of time and they end up, they're 18 or, or let's say they're in their early 20s and they live with their parents, they work at McDonald's, 
they're not they don't have any practical skills they don't even know how to use a a washer or a dryer and that's a sad story so when you watch pornography and by you again i don't mean you alex you got you have to see through it and see the let's say the innings of that thing how it was created it's about realizing how the intangible cost is much bigger than the tangible benefit. That's wisdom, I think, knowing the long-term consequences of your acts. We, we talked in the, I, when we had the opportunity to talk to each other in a more casual way, we talked about how pornography only exposes you, your senses in two channels, audio and visual, which is super different to the five senses that are stimulated while having a, an actual sexual relationship, and this also, I remembered about this part of our conversation while reading the book, The Case Against the Sexual Revolution by Louis Perry. There's another extract that I would like to share with you and, and have your thoughts on it, which is about sexual robots. So this is the extract. The impending arrival of realistic sex robots on the market is likely to intensify this super stimuli effect still further. The evolutionary biologist Diana Fleischmann writes of the malign impact of the new species of technology of the purchasers. Quote, the, cue, the cues a sex robot would provide to the evolved psychology of a previously disgruntled teenager would be you are achieving incredible mating success and status by staying at home and playing video games. Keep at it. Video games and social media already undermine the native psychological mechanisms that make us work towards status. They supply more immediate reward and take far less effort than anything we would we work towards out in the real world. Sex robots are only going to make that worse, especially for young men. And this is the, the end of the quote. This is precisely what you were referring to. When you're young and you haven't been exposed to a lot of life, you are lacking wisdom and you haven't been able to realize how not everything is a vice or a virtue. There's some distinction there. And the things that feel good in the short term don't necessarily need to be good. Yeah, that's right. But did you, did you just say that social media is easy? Uh, I think, uh, I, I, I mean, I mean, it's, it's pretty difficult for most people. But yeah, anyway, anyway, speaking of, speaking of this, all kinds of channels, I would add this. So, of course, you're right. And with the robots coming, it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be huge because they will, they will add senses. They will probably add smell, right? Sure. Phew. So you'll you'll get affected even more by those things. And look, I'm really scared about robots because, um, you know, I'm I'm scared of those rubber rubber things that you can use. So <laughs> with the robots coming and virtual reality, well, where you have three D porn and look, one one thing, one example. There is such a such a notion as custom porn where you get yourself deeper into this porn reality this way so you create a script you send the script to a company and you tell the company to create a porn video based on that script so the porn actresses and actors they create that script for you they act it out and then you get it you watch it you feel amazing and at this level, you feel engaged into this porn reality even more, right? Because why? Because they did exactly what you told them to do. So you were a part of it. And this is another step towards that virtual reality that's going to, I don't know. Frankly, I'm very concerned because looking at younger, I mean, of course I'm biased, yeah. But looking in the on an average guy who contacts me now, reaches out to me for help with doing nofap, that guy is in trouble because he's already addicted to video games, all kinds of content, including social media, and he doesn't have practical skills. He doesn't know English as well as Alex knows it. <laughs> and so, by the way, you... In, in, this, in this sense, Alex, you are a beautiful counterexample because instead of being this consumer, you are a creator. You are a creator and, let's say, a creator of your own podcast. 
I really appreciate that. And I mean, going forward, I would love to give you as an example of someone who is doing the right thing at 21. So you, okay, listeners, if you take one thing from this long monologue that I just did, and I'm not sure what I was, what I was driving at, but let me, let me give you some takeaway. <laughs> so the takeaway is lose the robot thing. Go for the real thing. <laughs> Simple, but effective. Yeah, I, I will be pleased to be an example of something good in life. That, that would be remarkable. In, I yeah, think. But, but Alex, Alex, you are making a huge mistake, by the way. You are reading a lot of books. Mm, that's consumption, isn't it? Yeah, that, I meant it as a joke, but you're right. You're right. What I wanted <laughs> to say is that you should, read a book, you should write a book already. You already have a lot of in you that wants to get out on paper or wherever. <laughs> All right, I'm, yeah. I'm a 21 year old. What the fuck do I know? I, how, how am I supposed to not have imposter syndrome when writing a book? Look, that's the, that's the best title of the book. At 21, what the fuck do I know? Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be a bestseller. Don't forget to pay me royalty. <laughs> okay. So what are the, the few basic steps you take people through in order to avoid the addiction because i guess there's a huge overlap between getting rid of the addiction to pornography and to other kinds of addictions like cocaine or not doing exercise or eating cheetos or whatever yeah okay so the process is pretty simple let me explain it to you so the first thing first thing i get to know them so that we can develop a nofap protocol and by nofap protocol what i mean is that if we are so we're thinking about quitting porn and masturbation and we're doing that in steps that's what i recommend because some people prefer to, to do it like cold turkey and just drop everything right away i mean yeah for some this works for others it doesn't work but we sit down and we realize that okay so maybe the first step for us for, for the guy would be to quit porn, let's say for one day. It feels as a win, then he relapses, and then he goes to two days. And then we built it to the point where he's able to quit pornography at all. Then we are reducing his excessive masturbation, again, in the small steps, small wins, small wins, to make sure that he reduces his jerking off to something no, quote unquote healthy, let's say once a week when he doesn't make a big deal out of it. Then I push him to get real sex. That's the third step. And when he gets real sex, the fourth step is to avoid masturbation altogether and to completely rewire his brain from his hand and the phone with porn on it to the real thing, the real girl. That, that's the basic process. Okay. So I guess that any kind of sex would work as long as you are getting rid of the porn, isn't it? Um, yeah, as long as it involves humans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. That, that's, <laughs> I was referring to humans, but inside of the human category, whether you are homosexual or heterosexual, I guess that a short-term relationship, part of the hookup culture, would not be as beneficial beneficiary to you as it would be a long-term commitment to a couple to a partner so I, I don't know if seeking for sex with a human in any conditions would be the best thing I, I could that could have been advice to young people I, I I would rather I this is my opinion I might be completely wrong about it but I think I have a strong bias towards long-term commitment in 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 the in the supplying of of sex to to people. I don't think getting a big part of your sex from uh, from short-term relationships is healthy. So yeah, what, what do you think of that? Look, in, okay, let, let me say this. So first of all, first of all, <laughs> I, I don't really care as a coach because as soon as the guy gets real sex and stops masturbation, <laughs> I'm happy. Yeah, okay. Because that's my goal. Like going, going after that, that's... Uh, uh, let's say outside of my responsibility for the guy. Now, in general, for myself, I I'm also 100% sure that long-term committed relationships are better because the juice of relationship 
is in the deep connection that you build with your partner over time by being vulnerable and relying on that partner, telling them, yes, please, yeah, let's share some responsibility. You share responsibility for me, I share it for you. And this creates beautiful, beautiful connection between the two souls. I hope I'm not getting too (laughs) woo-woo, but I mean, you're right. And I would only caution you because guys tend to be black and white. If we tell them right now, guys, go for the long-term thing. That's the best thing. They could overdo it. They would just be like looking for this long-term relationship all the time. And this, mm, I, I think speaking of dating, this is not the best advice when it comes to dating. Because you want to date people, you want to get to know yourself, what you like in the other person, and you want to like to have fun in dating. Whether as if you're coming into a, a dating situation, a, let's say date with someone, thinking about a long-term relationship. As a guy, you're going to ruin it because the girl will read it off you. And at the beginning of a relationship, you'll say dates one to five or maybe even one to ten. If you talk about these things, if they feel, if the girl feels that you're thinking about getting her committed, she will get scared. They don't want that responsibility. Girls take longer to fall in love. They, For them, it takes about two months. For you, as a guy, it takes two seconds. But you, you have to be careful with this. Whew. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I, I certainly agree with you in that you have to calibrate how fast you escalate the closeness or the deepness of the connection with the other person. If one person is already at the later, later stages of commitment and the other one is still in just seeing how... The other person trying to understand what the other person thinks about uh, anything, they are really not at the same pace, and they should get themselves at the same pace before any of them tries to act out any of the further actings that will come in the future. So, so yeah, even if you are seeking for your wife, you don't want that to be explicitly said. Maybe, maybe you can say it. Maybe you can say, "Oh, I'm I'm looking for a wife. This I'm not trying to hook up." Uh, with people but you you cannot seem desperate you sh- you shouldn't be like okay i'm i'm here and i i need you to be my wife please please be it that's not the way of going you have just to be casual there and sp- be like okay i'm here into something serious so let's see if we are compatible with each other i think that's the most healthy way of approaching it exactly exactly what you're talking about neediness and neediness is the killer of attraction whether you're a guy or a girl And yeah, let's put it like this. So let's say it's okay, it's okay to have this idea of getting a wife. And let's say maybe you are in your 30s. It's, I mean, it's normal to have this kind of a thought. But put it in the back of your mind when you are on a date. What should be in the front of your mind is having fun. That's it. Everything else will come automatically. Enjoy the moment and enjoy yourself but are you sure that the relationship should be enjoyable in the short term because if you are trying to maximize for enjoyment i would probably go with the less intelligent girl who will be thrilling having a relationship with her because this relationship will be unstable will do crazy stuff at 150 kilometers per hour in a motorbike (laughs) Maybe it's crazy stuff without using condom or like there's a lot of things that can happen with a person who's not mature or rational. And that might be thrilling and enjoyable in the short term, but there's an distinction there between what is enjoyable and what is good. So I think that applying some wisdom is always fundamental. You have to know, okay, what, what am I seeking for? And then after you know what you're seeking for, enjoy it. Yes, that's a good question, a very good distinction, because this is not what I mean. What are you talking about is like getting thrills, getting drama. What I'm talking is more like self-amusing and Mm. having fun in mm, in the moment by just enjoying whatever is happening. Even if the girl is boring and she doesn't give you the thrills, whatever, 
you still enjoy it. You make fun of yourself. You make fun of her in a teasing way, like in a friendly way, not, not abusing her or any other kind of thing. And it's look, it's just like our conversation. So right now I am having fun. I'm not exactly in, it's, it's like on a roller coaster at a Disneyland or anything, but I like it. I'm self amusing. I, 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 I do my best to be in the moment. I enjoy your energy. This is my definition of having fun. There exactly. That's, that's increasingly what I'm looking for in people close to me as time goes on. I didn't value it that much, but as time goes on, I, I start to value more and more articulatedness, being capable of sustaining a rational conversation with someone about, be it a complex topic or maybe not that complex of a topic, but just... Having an interaction which signals that the other person is interacting with you in a competent manner, that's the thing that I find the sexiest. And maybe in your case, you're a male, I, I don't find you particularly attractive in sexual terms, but I find it extremely attractive from a, a friend way. I would, I would love to have more friends li like you because it's, this is an engaging conversation, which I, this is precisely what I'm looking for in people around me. Mm. That's true. That's true. It's a, it's a balance. Let's say, well, if I speak of, of my experience, so let, let's say right now I'm talking to a girl uh, as a distant relationship and I like her a lot physically, physically. But as time goes, I feel that here and there she says something that sort of lowers my attraction for her and that that's because I don't maybe I don't see like the kind of intelligence that I want to see in her, even though for me, intelligence in a girl, it's not the most important thing. What do you think the most important is for me? Mm, faithfulness, respect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I would also add kindness, femininity, and let's say loyalty to the family. Mm, yeah. Yeah, that's definitely fundamental. But as time goes on, intelligence is more and more important, in my opinion. I think that this is something that we're going to very much disagree because, um, because just because of the age gap between you and me, you're 21, I'm 40. And I, I realized that, yeah, intelligence is great, but I made, look, I, I went through a divorce basically for this very reason. I wanted intelligence from my wife, ex-wife. She gave me pretty much everything else, but she did not care about reading books or doing personal growth with me. Like at one point, I, I tried to make her get up at 5 a.m. and sit down and work on Think and Grow Rich with me. Just like read it and create exercises and do it. That was crazy. That was crazy. And that... That was what murdered my marriage. And looking back, I would I would have done it so much differently. I would just I would just make sure that I I have fun and I am even like I I see this in 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 other couples where definitely the guy is way more intelligent than the girl. And I'm even wondering like like why like maybe they should not be together because they're not the the exact match in terms of intelligence but then i see how good this guy is at teasing the girl because when she makes like a stupid comment instead of getting angry at it he makes fun of her he makes a joke and they both feel great yeah, in 10 years, just let me know how it goes with okay. intelligence. <laughs> so so let me let me rephrase what you said, yes, to, so we can see that I got what you were saying. I'm not sure. You were saying that when you were younger, you were looking for intelligence in a much more, uh, in a more, in a more predominant way. And as time goes on, you realize that's not as important and you attribute the main reason for why your previous marriage failed to your asking your couple to have been more intelligently engaged with everything in general. That's right. That's right. That's, that's the, the, the best summary. And what would the solution have been? Would you, if, if you could act now, if, if you were 25 again, what would you have done in that exact same relationship? Yeah. 
just like that example of a friend, I would I would make sure that I have fun, have fun. And whenever I feel triggered in a situation where my ex-wife behaves in a not intelligent way, I would just turn it into a joke. And and by the way, speaking of like emotional control in general, I think this is the best way to behave in any situation where you get triggered. Someone does something that you don't like, maybe cuts you in traffic, make a joke. If you don't know what to do, if if you feel anger, frustration, disappointment, hatred, the best outlet is just to just to make fun of the situation and make fun of yourself. And in practical terms, just um, I think what works for me is speaking in, in funny voices about this, like, ah, that guy caught me. What a bastard. Ah, I'm so pissed. You know, like a Tony <laughs> Robbins thing. Yeah. Yeah, I think what you are referring to with all, all those negative emotions are in the root offense, getting offended. You cannot get offended by without your consent. I, I, you need my consent in order to be able to offend me. If, if I don't give you my consent, you're not going to offend me. I'm just going to be stay there, passive, analyzing what you are saying and trying to reason my way out of how incoherent your arguments are about how ugly I am. Maybe you called me ugly, but offense is never appropriate, neither in a in a road, as you said, when the, with the car, neither in an interaction with someone talking, because there's only two options. Either they are saying something right about you or they are saying something wrong, which they could also be saying those to offend you or not, because they might have good intentions or not. But either way, in any, in no of those four occasions, getting offended is actually the optimal strategy. You much better, you would rather act in a rational way trying to analyze what is being said and trying to argue against it if you believe that to be not true or if it is inappropriate to be saying that now let's say i'm in front of all my family and you say alex you are ugly maybe i'm ugly sure but that's not appropriate so the response there instead of being offended or instead of pursuing the guy who just cut you off in the in the highway would be to realize that there's nothing you can do now to get the the situation better all the cost has already been assumed. All the risk of your life has already been assumed. And there's no sunk cost fallacy that you have to fall into here. The only rational thing to do is to stay calm, stoically, and realize that the best next action is to keep acting in a rational way as you did just one second ago. You're right. And, and by the way, can I, can I give another answer to your previous question sure. about intelligence? That's, that's a very interesting point because I think that I don't I don't want to like to sound whatever my misogynistic or whatever. I love women. What I want to say is that I feel that the masculine energy is more about intelligence and being logical. Whereas the feminine energy is more about emotions. So when I tell you that I, I care at 40, I care about a girl's intelligence less. And that's why, because I want my girl to be more feminine. And if she, like the more intelligent she is, the more logical she is, the less emotional and feminine she is. So that's why for me, if we, let's say the, the opposite of intelligence is femininity. And you, if you ask me what I choose, I will choose femininity over intelligence seven days a week. And it's also harder to find extremely intelligent females. Did you know that the ex-director of Harvard was fired due to stating a statistical truth? He said that <laughs> there's less females in the top of the hierarchy in all the different fields due to the lack of females in the high side, in the high side of the distribution in IQ. And that's true. There's not as many intelligent girls as there are boys. And this is not because girls are less intelligent on average. There's also a lot of stupid boys. And what happens is that the tails are bigger. They are thicker yeah. in the case of males. So it's easier to find an extremely intelligent male than a female. And on average, they are equal. I'm not saying that females are less intelligent. And it's remarkable that this guy was fired from Harvard for saying a statistical truth, even if it's politically incorrect. It is true. What do you think of 
the difference in sexual strategies used by females and males. Do you think a big part of the problem in terms of porn addiction and um, addiction to romance novels in terms of in in the ca in the case of females is due to this la uh, difference in software as uh, it they talked about in the book I mentioned before about against the sexual revolution? Yeah. Well, yeah, that that's obvious just like we talked about the visual component. The guys, well, look, in, in very simple terms, in very simple terms, what um, I see a relationship is like this. So in a relationship, when it comes to, let's say, creating new life, the guy is responsible for the health component. He looks for the most beautiful girl because to him, this signals health. And the girl is responsible for the survival of the offspring in terms of intelligence, being strong, being confident, and maybe some like security in terms of, I mean, financial security. So yeah, the two sexes, they have very, very different strategies and ideas of what is attractive. It is the truth. This is the evolutionary drive. Okay. Yeah, it is. Because th think of it, understanding how the evolutionary environment made us in a super different way in case of the females and the males would enable your clients, I think, to understand that, okay, it's not you who are evil and are falling to these biases because you are stupid inherently. It's just that there's some adaptation between your environment and your physiognomy. Let's act accordingly. And that is a tremendously important piece of information to grasp. I would say it's the most important one. Exactly. And I think a good way to look at it is like this terrorist metaphor. So basically there is you and there is sex, the procreation. Now, a guy in a mask with a gun, he got hijacked. He hijacked this territory between you and real sex by abusing your sexual instinct. The guy is very skilled. He knows exactly what you want, and he put a stop for your sexual instinct at this point, saying, all right, you're not going to the real thing all the way, but you're stopping here. I'm hijacking you right now. And the good thing about porn, masturbation, orgasm, PMO, is that you can actually fight that terrorist very effectively if you want as long as you commit. We need to say this, guys listening to this, if you are addicted to porn or excessive masturbation right now, there is a way to get out of it. It's not easy, but it's doable. A lot of, a lot of guys did it, including myself. You can do too. And it's worth doing it. Well, if you ask me, I'm very biased, of course, but that's, that's the best thing in the world <laughs> to do. I'm kidding. I'm kidding, of course. <laughs> a, a much better thing is to, I don't know, watch a soccer game. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. It's been great, Roman, talking to you. You are an extremely insightful person, which I wish a lot of success for you in your career, being able to promulgate for correct ideas, in, especially in terms of porn addiction and detecting what is actually a vice. I think you're cause is extremely important and i wish you a lot of success where can people find about you do you, i think i know you have a web page social media maybe yeah yes of course so the the best way to get to know me my work and on top of that to start your pmo porn free journey is to go to my website which is romanmiranov.com slash free spelled as r o m a n m i r o n o v dot com slash free, and there you can get a free nofap tutorial that will push you to stop watching porn today. Okay, before letting our people go, let's say this: we didn't even mention that because we talked about a lot of other things. But why are you quitting porn? Because you will feel more confident, you will have more energy, you will have better results at the gym. You will have a healthier perspective on women. You'll stop objectifying them. And you'll feel in charge of your life instead of feeling totally not in control because your urges control you. You'll stop beating yourself up 
because of your constant relapses. You will stop having brain fog. You'll be able to focus more and be more productive. And if you're not sure if this benefits sound great, look, do one month experiment. Every man should be able to do that once in their life, 30 days of no porn, and see how you feel. Look, if you feel lousy, if you don't like it, I'll give you my money, your money back. Perfect. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. You did not pay me any money. Uh, <laughs> whatever. It's, it's free. Well, why not try it? Everyone listening, please try it. If you are male and you're addicted to porn, just quit it for a month. And if you and you and you will see the drive. The drive in males increases exponentially as the time without consumption of porn goes on. There, it's, it's amazing. The drive, which makes you want to do things and be creative and build stuff in general, it's obliterated by fake fake signals of success so please get the real signals of success that's right that's right and alex i really want to thank you for this opportunity to reach out to your crowd and just to spread spread the message which i do i do believe in with all my heart thank you very much roman it's, it's been a pleasure the pleasure has been mine thank you